very good question on half-truths, what data can and cannot tell us about modern India. The link to this book will be posted in the Zoom chat after this introduction. This book discussion is organized by the Institute of South Asian Studies, ISAS, at the National University of Singapore. Before we proceed with the event proper, I would appreciate it if you could switch off your videos and mute your microphones throughout the session. If, if you have any questions, please forward them via the Zoom chat. We will consolidate these questions for the speakers to answer during the discussion session. We are pleased to inform you that today's panel is being live streamed on the ISS Facebook page. This afternoon, we are delighted to have with us the following distinguished panel of speakers. Ms. S. Rukmini, author, Whole Number and Half Truth, What Data Can and Can Less About Modern India. Dr. Sneha Annavarapu, Assistant Professor, so Social Sciences, Urban Studies, Yale and U.S. College, Singapore. Dr. Diego Mar Mariano, Senior Assistant Professor, Contemporary History of India, University of Naples, and Visiting Research Fellow, Institute of South Asian Studies and U.S. Chairing the session is Dr. Karthik Nachia, Research Fellow at the Institute of South Asian Studies, NUS. I shall now pass the floor on to Dr. Nachia to be begin with the proceedings. Dr. Nachia please. Great, thank you so much, Anirudh. Um, it, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, ISAS book discussion on whole numbers and half-truths, uh, what data can and cannot tell us about modern India. Uh, we are delighted to have the book's author, Rukmini S., uh, an independent data journalist based in Chennai with us here today. Uh, this is Rukmini's first book, um, but the work here has been the product of years of, of deep reporting and data tracking across India. Um, with Rukmini, I am also pleased to uh, welcome two colleagues from and affiliated with NUS to discuss the book. Uh, Sneha Navarapu, uh, Assistant Professor of Urban Studies at Yale and U.S. College, uh, and Diego Majorano, a Senior Assistant Professor at University of Naples and uh, also affiliated here with ISAS. Uh, before we begin, I want to just highlight this, this remarkable book, um, which I have here with me, uh, and I encourage you all to, uh, to buy the book uh, and to read it. And the link, uh, as Anirudh had mentioned, will, will be in the chat box. Uh, so please do uh, check it out. Uh, today, we're gonna discuss the book, um, its different aspects, uh, the chapters, uh, the data that drives the book, and also the implications of the data, and largely of the need uh, for reliable and sound data uh, to infuse debates around uh, governance and development in India. Uh, in terms of the format, um, we are going to structure the initial part of the discussion uh, as a conversation. So my colleagues, uh, Diego, Sneha, and I uh, will cover different aspects of the book with Rukmini for about an hour or so. Uh, and then at 5 p.m., we will open the discussion uh, up for questions and responses from the audience. Uh, so please do put your questions in the chat box through the conversation so we can get to them later. Um, so without further ado, um, Rukmini, welcome. Uh, I, I want to begin um, by asking about the book. So the book's about data and what data can and cannot reveal about modern India. Can you lay out the book for us broadly? What does the data that you've uncovered um, tell us about India that differs from what we know or what we think we know about India? So thank you for having me, uh, Kathik. And I just want to say that, uh, you know, it's been such a pleasure even in the run up to this to, to be interacting with people who aren't sort of going through the motions, but seem to sort of share my enthusiasm about uh, data, about India, about the book. So that, that's been fun. Um, as you say, as you said, um, the book has come out of two sort of slightly separate sets of experiences that I've had over the last uh, 14 or 15 years as a journalist and me trying to bring them together. So in the beginning, as, as a rookie journalist straight out of journalism school, I uh, you know, was dispatched all over the city, first in Mumbai, where I lived at the time, then all over the state, and then increasingly all over the country to report on a you know, variety of experiences from elections to court cases to um, you know, boardroom battles, all sorts of stuff. Um, and then subsequently, later on, I did a master's in development studies. And then when I moved back to India, I decided to focus on data. 
And I found that, um, you know, the granularity that Indian data was able to give me in my understanding of the country was something that I had lacked during my um, experiences as a field reporter, while the sort of inner workings of Indian democracy that field reporting gave me a bird's eye view of was something that the data often missed. And what I wanted to do then was to marry these two sets of experiences, to try and bring together institutional knowledge about what we do know about reliable and good Indian data and what this does tell us about the country, as well as what the data misses because of um, uh, you know, loopholes in the data, gaps in the data, um, misleading data, um, those sorts of things. And, and I do want to um, emphasize that the first part of it is just as important as the second part, because I do think that there, there is an issue in sometimes overbroad skepticism about Indian data, which has resulted in the fact that I did feel that we didn't have this sort of institutional reckoning of what we can say about India through uh, good data that's come out over the last 10 years or so. And uh, you know, one of the reasons I've tried to keep, keep the data fairly recent and look at the last 10 years or so only, um, and even just these 10 years cover a broad set of uh, data sources, both governmental and private, that look at both um, you know, big questions around the economy well, as well as smaller questions around uh, you know, uh, how people look at um, uh, partner selection during the sort of uh, you know, wedding process, or from the big to the small. Um, so looking at these, uh, this sort of rich data that has come out of Indian and international agencies over the last 10 years, I've tried to um, answer 10 big questions about how India works. Um, because I feel that this sort of um, you know, granularity about these questions is, is missing. And we have these broad brush answers to big questions about India that are often deeply flawed, but have continued to persist over decades because we haven't really had a moment of stopping to look at what the data really says. So uh, they've reached the stage of commonly accepted narratives around India that essentially are zombie narratives. You know, they have no uh, basis in, in, in real fact. Um, this, this extends to things like, um, and I know this is something we'll go on to talk about because I, I know this is something that has exercised a lot of people. The issue, uh, the commonly held belief that, uh, that the median or the bulk or the majority of India is um, secular, is accepting of all religions, um, and there is a sort of fringe majoritarian minority. Um, uh, it's it's a sort of deeply held narrative that isn't actually um, you know based in any fact, and in fact is something that um, has been belied by survey after survey. But we just don't seem to be able to let it permeate into into sort of public uh, opinion. Uh, but this also holds true for other things like the commonly, um, you know, common beliefs around the jobs Indian do for Indians do, for example. I don't think there is broad acceptance among urban Indians, for example, that the most common job for an urban Indian woman is that of a domestic worker. I don't think, uh, you know, if it was the case, then the domestic worker would be much more central to, to Indian conversation, to pop culture, um, uh, you know. Um, similarly, I don't think that there's broad acceptance around uh, the way caste operates in modern India. There is sometimes um, a popular narrative that this is a sort of vestige of the past and uh, urban Indians live a largely casteless existence. And uh, a wide variety of sources both on economic data and on data around uh, you know, behaviors and attitudes show that, that this isn't in fact the case. So I've sort of tried to look at questions both around the economy, what, how in, what sort of work Indians do, what they typically spend money on, um, uh, where they earn their money from, as well as questions around um, beliefs, voting patterns, uh, things like that, which tend to be um, based more on behavioral and opinion poll sort of uh, data. I've also uh, looked a fair amount at crime statistics because this is something I ended up reporting on quite deeply as a reporter. And um, again, one of those points that I feel that, um, you know, if, if vanity allowed me, I would think that my reporting over the years should have changed the popular narrative around it. But it's a good um, uh, reality check to know that your little uh, reporting in one Indian newspaper has not changed the, the needle on popular beliefs at all, as is the case with 
with crime reporting about which we could also talk a little more. And finally, I end the book um, by looking at data around health because I feel quite deeply about, um, about a lot of what happened in India over the last two years during the pandemic. And, uh, you know, many of the tragedies that the world has gone through are those that were unavoidable. But some of those uh, that in India in particular sort of stand on the foundation of faulty understanding or sort of uh, opportunities to understand how, how caste and class intersect with uh, um, the lived reality of illness, whether you know it is the illness you experience, the amount you can spend on it, the, the sort of consistent um, refusal to engage with those realities is part of the foundation on which the sort of the tragedy of the last two years was built. So um, I look a little bit about, uh, I look a little bit at uh, COVID and at the pandemic as well. Um, so, uh, you know, the book sort of makes a plea for more people to engage with, with data and for data to be uh, presented uh, in a more accessible way, in a more transparent way, which is also something we could talk about because that is a, a huge issue in India right now, data transparency. Um, and then th there's also a sort of broader uh, coming together that I'm hoping to happen, which is I do feel that there's, as is in many parts of the world, a sort of breakdown between the ideological left and the right on many issues. Mm -hmm. Some of these um, divides are almost impossible to bridge, but, uh, but parts of the divide that rest on uh, assumptions around data, I do also make a plea for a slightly less ideological or nonpartisan approach to looking at the data at least, um, so that you know we can stop talking past each other, which is really something that India along with the rest of the world has been doing for the last couple of years. So we're gonna to get to some of those narratives uh, later on. And and I'm glad you brought up health data, because as you mentioned in the health data, so in the health chapter, a lot of health data in India today is unusable for various reasons. Um, and the book, you know, in, in many ways also reveals the challenges of categorizing, gathering, working with, using and, and analyzing data in India, you know, and then having it influence um, public policy. Uh, and you, you do argue that India's big statistics are also only half truths, meaning they kind of capture, they, they do not capture the totality of what it, of what it um, illuminates, right? And I guess the large size of India and the scale of statistical work that is required does, um, I, I, I guess, um, make it very hard to, 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 to kind of collect that data. So can you talk first a bit about you know, the sources of data that you collected, both public and private, uh, that have been used in the book, um, you know, where are they from, uh, and where did, the where did the problems lie here in terms of Indian data, and who's fundamentally responsible? Okay, so um, I do want to start, make, start by making the point that I think um, the Indian data enterprise is fundamentally, um, uh, awesome in its ambition, especially, uh, uh, you know, in its um, in stages of its infancy. Um, and I don't think that that is something that is, uh, you, you know, adequately recognized and admired either. So I do, um, you know, try to make a push for that as well. Um, the statistical architecture that India put in place um, at its, you know, founding moment was um, was far out of its league. It was it was in a in a sense like India's space program. It was reaching for the moon when it had no right to. It didn't have the money or the or the sort of uh, levels of development that uh, would justify um, the ambition of the statistical architecture it put in place then. But it did it anyway because of um, uh, you know the ambition and the sort of uh, commitment to statistics of some key individuals at that moment. And it has served us very well. The statistical ar architecture has been rightly the envy of the uh, of the world coming out of the shadow of colonialism, but also of many uh, developed countries. Uh, India had a nationally representative household survey at a time where virtually no one did across the world, um, and it was done at, at a scale um, as, as you know it, need, it would need a minimum of 100,000 households to say anything usefully uh, representative about India. 
So those um, foundations stand. And, and I think uh, sometimes in the sort of on discussions around institutional decay in India, we sort of assume complete decay. And um, that definitely is sometimes the conversation around Indian statistics as well, where there's a sort of assumption that the whole thing has crumbled to the ground. And that's very much not the case. So uh, while there are a lot of half-truths that emerge from Indian data, I do want to say that uh, that Indian data also is perhaps one of the few sources of data that um, that give adequate representation to India's poor, to India's marginalized, who don't feature in um, in any in very who feature very little in privately conducted surveys, do not feature in online surveys at all, and hence you know are far more likely to be left out of popular conversation. So I think one of the reasons there is sometimes a pushback, particularly from the right or let's say from a constituency that believes in a fast progressing India, this pushback against Indian statistics is, is uh, exactly because it seems to paint a picture of a far poorer country than otherwise seems to be the case. Um, and that is because Indian statistics are the only one that are, that are producing uh, you know, nationally representative information about the spending patterns of the absolute purest of, poorest of the country who don't make it to um, you know insurance or payroll statistics or other sort of administrative um, sources of um, information um, so yeah that that's my sort of beginning defense of of indian statistics um, the broad sources of data that I've looked at um, tend to be um, government data biased and this doesn't come from any um, you know um, pious belief in government, but more from the fact that um, that the extent of um, surveying required to put up a nationally representative survey is something that is far out of the reach of most private agencies. Even private agencies that do do it tend to oversample urban households just because it's so much easier. So I rely on the Indian census and on multiple uh, national sample surveys produced by, again, by India's uh, statistical architecture. I find these national sample surveys fascinating. They're not just the bedrock of uh, consumption and important issue, employment, important issues like that. But there's also, they're also the reason we know things like um, how many minutes of leisure uh, and the Indian woman gets in a day, or, or the fact uh, or we know that Indians are far more likely to go on pilgrimages than on holidays. These are things that also emerge from official data, even though they don't seem to, you know, be, uh, you wouldn't imagine that surveys that um, aren't asking the big meaty questions are also ones that are conducted by government. I also rely quite heavily on the National Family Health Surveys, which which uh, uh, look at all information around uh, health, demographics, um, the experience of violence. These are some of the important questions they ask. Um, on the side of um, uh, private uh, surveys, I sort of have to set the bar pretty high and then not allow other surveys that don't meet those um, criteria to get through, which is that they need to be transparent, have some access to raw data, even if not to me, the data is there available to researchers somewhere, large samples, methodology clear, funding clear, that sort of thing. So I rely quite heavily on the India Human Development Surveys conducted by India's National Council for Applied Economic Research and the University of Maryland in the US. Um, the third round is now sort of kicking off, which is exciting because it will have it will be one of the most exciting new sources of data that we'll have in a while. Um, in the recent years, people have also started looking quite heavily at uh, a survey that calls itself the world's largest panel survey, which is the um, uh, Center for the Monitoring of the Indian Economy's Consumer Pyramid uh, Household Survey. This is a very large sample uh, survey. However, it is um, urban skewed, and then that raises questions about um, its representativeness, but um, it is going to be increasingly used um, uh, by researchers as well, just because of how high frequency it is and the fact that you're going back to the same households again and again. So in the last six months, for example, one of the innovative uses of the CPHS has been to uh, consider the question of excess mortality, because if you're going back to the same households, you can potentially ask them if they lost someone in the last year or two, which is something that the Indian government hasn't yet got around to asking people. Um, I don't typically do a lot of uh, work around opinion polls, especially um, uh, those that are in the business of predicting elections, because I find them um, uh, I find them very narrow. And uh, I think you know by relying on these surveys, we are um, we are narrowing our understanding of 
of Indian voters by assuming that only the questions that these opinion polls ask are the thoughts in voters' minds, while uh, you know the, the fault lies in the questioning and not really in the mind of the voter, in, uh, to, to put it crudely. Um, I do rely on opinion polls a little bit when it comes to the chapter on um, Indian beliefs. Um, again, I've tried to look more at the more established sources like uh, Pew, uh, the Pew Research Center surveys, as well as the Indian organization, uh, the Center for the Study of Developing uh, Societies, which is a sort of academically respected uh, organization with a 50 year history of conducting opinion polling in India. Um, in the last few years, uh, data journalism has also evolved in India to um, start creating innovative sources of data to get past barriers those barriers typically being either the data not existing or the government not sharing that data. So in the case of crime, what I had to do, for instance, is sort of put together my own database of uh, court judgments. Um, those court judgments existed, but they weren't you know, categorized in any meaningful way. So that was a database I had to put together. And in the last few years, um, uh, sort of public spirited organizations working with legal, in, legal data in India have started putting together uh, enormous uh, databases of this sort. So this is an another exciting new direction, um, another exciting new source for, for Indian data journalism. Um, I think we've also had to be quite innovative in uh, looking at uh, data for uh, during the pandemic, um, which is something we could talk about a little more as well, because that's another key area in which uh, there was a severe lack of data available in the last two years, which required collaboration, which is another sort of heartening development in India over the last couple of years, very sort of public spirited, um, collaborative, uh, volunteer driven, um, uh, you know, synergies between journalists, researchers, uh, programmers and developers who can extract data. There's a lot of that happening as well. Uh, Sneha, over to you. Hi, Rukmini, it's such a pleasure to be here to discuss and really celebrate this brilliant book. Uh, many congratulations uh, to you for not just writing it, but also for the way it has been received. I think the reception speaks to how parched we as a reading public were for a book that tries to make sense of the swirl that we find ourselves in as Indians. So thank you for bringing a sense of clarity and providing us with the tools to ask better questions about um, the world that we live in. I must admit that when I first heard of your book, I did not imagine reading it. And I'm only half kidding, but really I say this partly as someone who's terrified of all things numbers, but partly also as an ethnographer who's perhaps a bit defensive after having been told time and again that anecdotal evidence is inferior to the hard real data of numbers, right? That only statistics offer us the real truth about the world. It of course does not help that I'm terrible at math, <laughs> but either way, being an ethnographer by training, one of the techniques that I take very seriously is paying close attention to the little theories that people make about the world around them, these causal inferences, surmises, uh, addressing all these puzzles around them, so on and so forth. But today I just wanted to acknowledge that I absolutely love how you take this aspect of what we do in our lives, constructing narratives, making sense. You take this very seriously instead of writing it away as being inferior to the real data that you bring in the book. Um, what you do so beautifully show how theories and conclusions based on just false information and myths based on propaganda and fear have really dire consequences. That it, it's not just that there are good and bad theories, but that bad data, wrong data can give us dangerous theories and such a distorted understanding of the world we live in. You also weave in little snippets of real life interactions that you've had with people to buttress the patterns that you're finding in your numbers, graphs and charts. Other than perhaps adding that humanizing aspect to the data, I think it sharpens your own arguments and I think helps readers connect the abstract with the more concrete. For me, and I'm sure for many others, the book then went beyond mere myth busting to a more profound consideration of the lies we are fed and the lies we tell ourselves every day. Um, so most importantly, then the book became a springboard or becomes a springboard for social scientists and journalists alike to ask better question. And for that, and for so much more, all my appreciation from a rather statistics shy standpoint. But coming to the meat of the book, and as the urban sociology representative on this panel, I wanted to start out with a chapter on cities. So the chapter on cities and migration, which is titled How India Lives and Where, was so terrific and bust so many popularly held myths around urbanization and migratory patterns. You first show how the so-called rapid urbanization of India is actually an inaccurate way to talk about what's really going on here. While there is an increase of population living in urban agglomerations, this increase 
is a particular feature of class one cities, right? And instead you posit that India is not urbanizing as fast as its Asian and African counterparts and is still quite rural. You then focus on two causes and factors that might explain India's urban story. One is natural growth rate of population and the second is migration. I wanted to focus on migration today as I think there are such interesting findings that you've succinctly presented to us. In particular, I love the point that you made that migration is actually not a male story, it's a female story because women make up 68% of the migrants in India and 66% of them migrate because of marriage. And it seems so like commonsensical after you point it out, but until then the migration story is so male in our heads, right? Um, so drawing on several such counterintuitive data patterns, you argue that unlike popular belief, migration is actually not leading to a surge in urbanization the way we understand it. So could you walk us through some of the key data that help you argue this? And I would also love for you to dwell a little bit about how cities and villages are classified and how do these classifications affect data collection and analysis? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks uh, very much for that. I just wanted to make a, uh, you know, a couple of things um, to show the sort of similarities of uh, where we, you know, the space in which we exist. One is that uh, I too do not have a background in maths or statistics. And I think, uh, you know, this isn't a humble brag. Everyone who can get out and uh, study more maths and stats should. Uh, I don't think, um, I don't think it's, I would, I don't think, I mean, I think it limits your data journalism and you could do more with better numbers. But, um, I, you know, I think it helps in how I write because, um, uh, it's not really explanatory journalism for me. It is the extent to which I understand numbers and that is the extent to which I need to understand it to be able to explain it as well. So I really wonder if, you know, the absence of my maths and statistics uh, training, in a sense, helps make it um, easier to understand. And it's so interesting, um, the point that you point out about um, being often told that, uh, you know, ethnographic stories or anecdotes are inferior to statistics. Uh, one of the things, um, you know, one of the walls you come up against as someone who communicates with data is that you're systematically reminded that data doesn't change minds, numbers are cold, um, and, you know, uh, people skim over it, you're fighting for space on a newspaper, if you start with a number, you're going to lose the reader. You know, I don't think any of these sort of shibboleths uh, work, neither what you were told, not, not what I was told. But um, in a sense, I too have struggled with this in that I do accept that uh, stories are important to communicate the point that numbers are making, but I, I struggle with uh, with the use of it as a device. And uh, I have uh, you know tried not to do that, um, which is again not something that's difficult to do because I enjoy people's stories very much and I enjoy you know communicating those. But yeah, I suppose um, any of these isms are are so. Um, you know, it's just not how, it's so counterproductive. And I think both what you were told and what I was told, um, sort of, they just, they produce these blocks that inhibit thinking. Um, and yeah, or, of course, a combination or, or what comes out of your mind when you take it all together is probably what's ideal. Um, Yes, and I, I am glad that as uh, that people who have uh, typically found numbers intimidating have picked up the book. You know, one of the things that happens in India a lot is that the study of math is often uh, quite strongly associated with various types of privileges. Uh, you know, the teaching of math in in a lot of schools and in uh, uh, schools to which more marginalized children go in particular is is lacking uh, and then produces these sort of fears. So, um, you know, getting past that and being able to communicate this, the point that comes out through numbers to people who have been had, who have had to fear number for numbers for no good reason is, is, is a mission that I um, take seriously. Um, uh, yes, you know, um, one of the things I've had to consider after the book while talking to people is what parts of it what parts of my own research surprised me and actually the parts on uh, urbanization that you've uh, pointed to are among those that surprised me i do remember while while studying for my masters being uh, having you know the, for, uh, for the first time coming up against 
uh, this theory that India was actually urbanizing slower than it had been expected to, um, or that was that should have been expected for this level of development. And I remember being surprised by it then, but I was particularly surprised when I looked at uh, the numbers now. And it's one of those things that um, uh, you know comes up again when the when the census numbers come out every ten years. Uh, we India many Indian states have been systematically. Um, undershooting, I'm going to in, make up a word, uh, undershooting what should have been expected uh, at their levels of urbanization. But this is somehow, again, not a story that pierces through. You know, I think um, the, the Indian media or pop culture has got so wedded to the notion of a rural urban surge that even when it was staring us in the face, as it was when the 2011 census numbers came out, and it was already clear that many states had not even reached 50% urban when they were expected to, that story didn't um, come out uh, strongly enough because I, I think this is another sort of narrative that many in India are now wedded to. Um, I also think that uh, considering data on migration over the last uh, year or so, has, there have been aspects of it which have been of surprise to me. While I have known for a while that uh, that the female migrant is is the median Indian migrant and is uh, you know underrepresented uh, underrepresented again in uh, both research and in pop culture. Um, the, one of the parts that I really feel, again, we need to have a reckoning with, and perhaps we were forced to have a reckoning with in India um, at the beginning of the pandemic, was the pervasive nature of a seasonal and short-term uh, migration. And uh, this is one of those things that exists sort of in the space in between numbers, because a lot of Indian statistics um, in the very nature of the question uh, that is asked uh, will systematically undercount short-term and seasonal migration. Indian statistics are geared much more towards counting permanent migration. And while this is, while permanent migration is important to understand how uh, cities and states change over time, uh, it misses the migrant experience uh, greatly by not capturing seasonal migration. In this respect, the work of, um, uh, you know, the historian Chinmay Tumbe over the last few years, particularly in his book, India Moving, um, is a great source of information to better understand seasonal and short-term migration. And I think this was one of the stories that emerged from those um, visuals of millions of Indians on their feet walking home uh, when the country shut down in March, 2020. Um, you know, it exposed two things. One is, <clears throat> I think many urban Indians ask themselves the question of how is it that these people have such little money that with one week of uh, work being shut down, they have to go home. And, you know, I think the answer really lay in that question itself, which is that, this is how little money people have and we haven't um, uh, allowed it to really you know we talk about daily wage uh, earners but have we truly considered the fact that an enormous share of indians um, if they don't work for the day really would not be able to feed their families or definitely not at the end of the week which is what we saw um, then of course there are you know um, more sociological uh, questions around um, security around ties around networks around the breakdown of all of that in, in urban cities, the hostility of the destination city, all of those are things to be considered. But I think it also spoke about the nature of seasonal and short-term migration. These are not, these were not uh, ties built over uh, years and decades. These were people uh, who had come there for maybe a, you know, a particular job of moving from job to job. And when that dried up, home still existed. You know, home had not changed in, in your census definition. Um, you still remained, uh, that was still home. So, um, uh, you know, I think one of the things that 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 happened uh, when I tried to consider this question is, I really had to think about what urbanization really means. Um, and to think of it then as a physical act of a city moving from being, of a place moving from being a village to a city is again something I think I hadn't considered over a while. And I actually found the contestations around uh, urbanity, around the act of being declared urban, um, uh, fascinating. I mean, they, 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 there was real humor in it to to even consider the, the the point that there were that there are entire cities or entire uh, parts of the country that have now for decades waged a war against being declared a city you know um, there there are very sensible reasons to do this there are questions around taxation but uh, it um, you know becoming urban is not some sort of 
um, uh, secular process and and this is you know it's these are contested issues these are very um, live and dynamic processes and sometimes this isn't uh, captured either in statistics or in reporting so for example i find in uh, in the book i looked at places in which um, you know entire political outfits have have sprung up to fight against urbanization and this actually worked in multiple uh, municipal co uh, councils that i looked at in the state of maharashtra for example um, sometimes it even was the case that if there was a particularly charismatic local leader who was able to carry this process that area was able to fight the urban tag for for years and even decades and then if that leader's uh, influence wore off if he either joined a political party or um, you know passed on and his uh, legacy was not taken forward that entire uh, movement faded away and then that was the path to urbanization you know as um, as complex uh, as it gets um to the question of um uh, why um uh, migration to into cities is actually lower than it appears to be, um, lower than we popularly imagine it to be. I think we often do not consider um, uh, how expensive it is to make this leap of faith. In the popular imagination, again, uh, migration is what the poorest of the poor do. It is an act of desperation. Um, and of course, uh, there are, um, you know, deep economic uh, needs that drive migration out of villages. But I think uh, what's often not understood is how much capital, both uh, social and economic, is required to make these uh, journeys. They are, you know, arduous journeys. They are often uh, over long distances. Uh, they are very far from the comfort zones of people with of the you know places people are emerging from. Just for an example, um, some uh, some years ago, I was in the eastern state of Jharkhand uh, reporting on elections. Um, and at that time, in the village I was in, uh, all of the young men of that village were working on construction sites in Chennai. Um, I hadn't yet moved to Chennai at the time. I still lived in Delhi, but I was already married uh, to my husband, who's from Chennai. And I, you know, sort of mentioned that as conversation to the to the older women who were the only sort of people left in the village there. And their questions about Chennai were almost as if we were talking about an entirely different country on the opposite side of the world. And that sort of brought home to me just how long these journeys are. I mean, they're physically long, but they're also so far from the lived experience um, of where people are coming from um, that, you know, we need to consider all of those um, uh, decisions uh, when it comes to making these journeys. So um, I think what's happening with migration is it's both undercounted and um, sort of there is a lot of it and very little of it so there's very little of permanent migration of the sort that we imagine because mobility in india is difficult and is costly but there's also much more seasonal migration than we typically understand and it's of a far more dynamic nature so again in the book i talk of, about um, migrants who come from eastern states to do um, agricultural work in the fields of the more uh, agriculturally prosperous prosperous states including punjab and over time, as the agricultural calendar has shifted in these states, both for sort of climate change reasons and also for um, sort of official policy reasons, this journey has, has had to make various detours. So there's now a detour in a city to uh, maybe run, a, run a, um, a cab for a couple of months before you can make it to the sowing season. Um, all of these are um, you know processes that really capture change in the country which are largely missed by official data. So I was talking recently to someone who is, you know, part of launching a large new survey in India. And I was saying that uh, understanding this, the, the very complex and dynamic nature of seasonal migration is perhaps something that, um, you know, a new or a better survey would do a good job. Uh, would It would be a really valuable co uh, contribution. Yeah, um, I mean, I was also thinking of how the rural to rural migration numbers were very high, and that was very interesting to know. But I have another question, but I'm going to hand over the mic to Diego, who I'm sure has a couple of questions to ask. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. And uh, thank you, uh, Rukmini, for, uh, well, writing the book, first of all. Uh, but I also have a more of a personal thank 
to Rukmini because if she could see my chronology in my browser, she would see that every single time I have written something that has to do with numbers in India, my first search on Google is the type of data I need and then followed by Rukmini S to see, because she has probably already dug into the data, explained them in an uh, accessible manner, uh, and then most of the work that I should be doing. So thank you uh, for all this uh, unseen work that you have done uh, for me and for ISAS that hosted you today. Um, a second uh, more serious thing is that uh, uh, this is uh, an incredible book again, and uh, this is um, the, the third book in a row that I uh, read from journalists, Indian journalists and writers that was really, really, really good and made me understand India a lot more than much of what uh, my colleagues in the social sciences actually write. Uh, I'm referring to uh, Snigda Poonam, The Dreamers, uh, and Sonia Falero, uh, The Good Girls. Um, so this, uh, and Rukmini's book is a third in a series for, for me at least. Um, and all of these books are really readable, um, really grounded uh, into the empirical reality. And perhaps because they don't really need to fit into existing social sciences theories, um, they actually make you understand what is really going on. Uh, so I, it's really something that we all should be uh, learn from, we social scientists, um, when we write our own, uh, our own research. Um, the, the, the book is also um, a, a great merit of the book um, is also that as uh, Snea and, and also Kartik said, that makes you question a lot of the things that you think you know about India and are actually either false uh, or uh, at least very questionable. Um, so on the one hand, I hope my students will never find your book uh, because they will say, oh, well, Prof. Diego taught us a lot of very questionable things about India uh, in good faith. But on the other hand, it's really, really, really useful for all of us, again, uh, as teachers to to, to go through this uh, this book and, and see uh, what we have been teaching uh, uh, to, to our students, uh, um, we can teach them in a, in a much better way uh, and in a much more nuanced, uh, uh, nuanced way. So really, again, uh, thank you. And the third uh, um, a brief comment on the book is that I guess this is really a book that would be really important for policymakers of India, but really of, uh, of any country to, to have a read. Um, even though I suspect it's also the kind of book that policymakers don't really want to read, um, especially if we think of how data are usually used in policymaking, right? We take a decision and then we look up for the data to justify the, the decision. Um, here, the book uh, is a plea for doing the, the other way around. Let's see, we have a problem, more uh, of a textbook, if you like, kind of policymaking process. Uh, but for those policymakers willing to, uh, to do the effort, it's really, really, really worth uh, to see what uh, is behind the numbers, because I, I'm quite sure that not even policymakers are really uh, understanding what is behind the data that they use on a daily basis. Anyway, uh, enough for me, and uh, I will go through uh, a question on one of the chapters that was really uh, jaw-dropping for me. Um, how much money do Indians make? Uh, it's chapter five, and I think it's an incredible, important part of India's growth story uh, that we need to be told more. Uh, and this is the story of how poor just India is, uh, because we, we have all seen, you know, the incredible development that has taken place over the last few decades, but uh, it's, um, we, we, we tend to forget uh, that uh, there is a very large part of the country, the largest part of the country that is still very, very poor. Uh, and this has, in, I think, very important consequences on the way also we, uh, we think about policymaking in India because we think we're doing, well, not me, but policymakers are doing policies for a country that is at a certain level of development, but on the ground, it's actually much poorer than we think. And um, a mind blowing detail that um, the book provides is uh, that of a family um, that from Tamil Nadu uh, and 
the the head of the family is a cooker and a house cleaner uh, and uh, the entire income of the disposable income of the of the family is 5875 rupees a month or about 105 singapore dollars uh, in this tiny sum of money put them in the top 20% of the urban richest urban indians so again the family of a cooker and a house cleaner which are jobs usually associated with the with the lower classes actually translate into uh, the top 20% of the urban Indians, uh, which is mind blowing to me. And also this also by implication means that um, where is the middle class if uh, this, uh, this family is actually in the top 20% of the income scale. So uh, the question is, can you tell us about more about how poor India really is and where or what is India's middle class? Thank you. Um, thank you for all of your kind words um, uh, before as well. And yes, I do agree that, um, uh, you know, the numbers on India's um, uh, consumption and income are again, these are again numbers that have existed in the public domain for a while, but clearly have not sort of permeated into public opinion and the sort of popular belief at all. Um, some of it, I think, stems from a sort of suspicion that uh, that the rich do not declare their numbers and, you know, uh, official statistics miss this. And so there are a lot of rich people and they're much richer than us. And so we must be in the middle class. I think this is a sort of uh, lie of comfort that a lot of very well off Indians like to tell themselves. Um, and the reason that I don't think this is true is because um, uh, India's household consumption expenditure numbers, which come from the National uh, Sample Survey, which is again, you know, this long pedigreed institution, could uh, be missing some consumption at the highest end, but it does a fairly good job, a good enough job to give us a pretty solid picture of where we are. And where, where that picture is, is, is the way you have described it, which is that uh, Sorry, I'll come, I'll come back to it in a minute. Um, I've just marked that out, I'll come back to it in a minute. Um, and again, then there's a picture, there's a sense that, um, that these uh, numbers are long out of, you know, that they're very old and that we don't have recent numbers and all of this growth has happened in the last couple of years. Well, it is true that we don't have publicly available uh, numbers on household consumption, but that's because the numbers that did come out in 2017, 18 were promptly suppressed by the government. Um, but th these numbers are available to journalists and others, um, uh, you know, researchers and others, because the, the report was completed and, you know, uh, was formally completed. These aren't sort of informal estimates. And those are the estimates that we now have. Those are for just uh, five years ago. Um, and if anything, we've had a, you know, global pandemic since then. So there's uh, no, not good reason to assume that there has been great growth in these last five years that, that the numbers miss. So I do think this is an example of the numbers very much staring us in the face, but a consistent refusal to accept that, um, that this is what the Indian reality looks like. Um, uh, these are numbers on consumption and not on income. The best source of data that we have on income is now about 10 years old, but uh, of course those numbers uh, are also you know, uh, worrying because those numbers show, for example, that uh, on a per capita basis, only the top 2% of the country would have a household income of over 800,000 rupees, which is again, uh, and this is a, an annual um, household income. This is again, you know, uh, something, I think a lot of Indians would probably say, a lot of uh, rich Indians would uh, say that they believe that the top 2% of the country makes over 800,000 per month, that that would be sort of a, a rough estimate of perhaps what, uh, you know, the average Indian thinks of the rich. Um, so yes, these are sobering numbers that uh, survey after survey confirms income numbers from 2011-12 confirm it, consumption expenditure from the same year matches this income data well. 2017-18 data showed that there was actually uh, you know, the first real decline in consumption in decades, um, which that which uh, economists have linked to India's disastrous uh, demonetization experiment in 2016. Um, you know, since that report, as I said, was suppressed, we haven't had official data on household consumption since then. 
Um, I think the question of a middle class is is interesting, and it's a sort of it's the intersection of political science and and the economy over here. Because in uh, if you sort of try to imagine uh, a political science definition of the middle class, it would it would converge quite well with what you would think of a numerical middle class, which is that uh, that this is a fairly secure class that is not uh, you know, worried about daily existence and that can then do things like planning for the future, focusing on education, desirous of stability, all of the sort of political science expectations of a middle class. But to me, when I look at the numbers, I really see it as uh, those who are officially poor the, under India's official poverty line, then those who are not officially poor, but are for all practical purposes uh, living extremely precarious lives. And then there is a, a small upper middle class and a rich segment that is um, you know, politically um, in popular culture, uh, through social capital, extremely powerful. Um, I think what people would at most concede is someone like uh, the cook who I have described, whose example you know you mentioned as well is at most people would like to think of her as middle class. They would say, okay, you know, this is not a poor person. This is not a person who regularly needs uh, government handouts, as as you know the Indian uh, middle class, the Indian rich like to call it. Um, this is a working class person. Uh, someone who has a small uh, self-help group loan. So perhaps this is the definition of the middle class. Um, but in, in numerical terms, again, she exists really in the top 20% of the country. Um, I think uh, the first step to identifying a middle class would be to try to understand what we are looking for, uh, you know, the purpose of this identification. And I think the most common sort of shorthand use of the middle class in India is really to... Um, distance itself from the poor and uh, to make demands for um, for sort of special treatment for the rich without calling ourselves the rich. So you typically see the term middle class used very often in uh, around the Indian budget when people want to say that, or even around Indian elections, all of this emphasis on the poor, schemes for the poor, uh, politicians are asking for votes uh, and promising things for the poor, what about the middle class? Essentially, these are rich people who want to know what further benefits and entitlements they can ask of uh, for the state uh, while not wanting to uh, use the term rich for, for themselves. Um, um, because if we were if we were trying in sort of any honest way to understand what a middle class really looked like, we would have to come to the conclusion that that India perhaps needs its own uh, political science definitions for a middle class. This is not a secure segment at all. This is not a segment that is free from um, uh, immediate concerns and that can uh, freely plan for the future. Uh, there are, there is also a strong uh, uh, caste dynamic to uh, the jobs and to the um, uh, you know economic breakdown by category. Um, so uh, India would require an entirely new definition of a middle class if it was to uh, accurately look at who its middle class really is. Thank you. Uh, I think Kartik, over to you now. Uh, do you does Sneha want to just come in for with the second question? And then maybe. Um, yeah, sure. I'm going to keep this really quick. Uh, well, the chapter titled What India Thinks, Feels and Believes was a bit difficult to read as it brought forth certain uncomfortable truths that, uh, you know, debunk the myth or perhaps the desire of a certain sliver in India that the average Indian is actually a liberal person, no matter what political parties say or do. You find that there's a very worrying trend around casteism and interreligious intimacies and friendships and even around questions of women's empowerment. But at the same time, you find that views around homosexuality have gotten more liberal over time. I think I was certainly more surprised about the acceptance of homosexuality than I was about the fact that India has been and continues to be deeply casteist and Islamophobic. But I was, as I was thinking along these lines, I began to get very curious as to what in the data surprised you as someone who's been a journalist for so long now, and what in the data seemed rather obvious to you, but that your readers have perhaps expressed surprise over and would just to get a sense of your reflections and your data discoveries uh, would be great. Thank you. Yes, I do think that actually uh, the changing views on homosexuality is among um, uh, the insights in the book that did surprise me. I uh, find it hard to theorize around it because I don't think there's been uh, good research 
beyond uh, you know even the way the question is asked in the world value survey is is clunky and yeah. you know sort of uh, it asks people's views on a range of issues from evading um, uh, a ticket on a bus to uh, accepting homosexuality so yeah, we definitely need far more um, sort of involved and engaged questions perhaps around sexual identity alone uh, till till we get to um, a point of understanding it better it's also an interesting question in india to consider um, sort of what came first legal reform or um, changing views in society because these sort of coincided with each other uh, you know we've had a, a, a the decriminalization of homosexuality in india by the courts has in uh, 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 sort of anecdotally people tell us that it did have an have an impact on acceptance in society once it became you know once that fear of doing of your child doing something illegal was removed um right. did sort of uh, uh, you know allow more um, acceptance so it, it's it's something that stands out so much as an outlier in the rest of the data that it is something that does call for a uh, better understanding just as a another point when the supreme court of india was considering this issue around decriminalization decriminalizing homosexuality that was one of the points at which it became actually clear how little data we did have around this at all because the court wanted to know uh, you know know, know something about numbers or what size this minority was and um uh, it was not something that anybody could put any decent estimates to so um it it's certainly something that calls for uh, more study um i think uh, what people have been um you know maybe we have moved or most people have moved from a sort of feeling of uh, all indians are broadly accepting and tolerant to a state of believing that most indians are broadly tolerant and there is a small fringe uh, intolerant minority mm-hmm. um i think what, uh, there's a there's a sort of popular narrative which has been um which has got more sort of backing in the last few months for a very specific uh, reason uh, is also the belief that indians are um, tolerant broadly in society but perhaps might be more intolerant when it comes to uh, their personal lives when it comes to who they allow their children to marry for example and interestingly i think this is something that actually got reinforced by a pure research center survey that came out uh, in last year that asked questions around uh, religious beliefs and uh, i reported on the same survey and i used that survey quite uh, substantially in the book i think it's a good survey as well but to me uh, what the survey actually showed is how broadly uh, intolerant of other religious beliefs indians are there was just one question in that survey which asked uh do you think most people should be allowed to sort of practice whichever religion they want and most people said yes in that and that became a, a sort of um headline point for the surveyors and then for all of the indian media after that to um run with the sort of narrative that indians are broadly tolerant however um uh, intolerant on these aspects i don't think the uh, sum total of the numbers or the answers justified that at all and i wonder if it was a uh, you know need to be slightly more palatable that that drove this but i think it's actually done a lot of damage because um, i think this has got sort of rep- uh, repeated ad nauseum um and i think this is a reckoning that india needs to have around religious and casteist beliefs which is that uh Uh, you know um, and i have made this comparison in the book as well between um indian views on the practice of on inter caste marriage or inter religious marriage with uh, responses given by american respondents in uh, us surveys and as i made the point in the book i'm not trying to neither is the research paper i'm referring to by the economist hail pile hathi nor am i uh, making the argument that racism has vanished from the from the us which no one would argue however it does point to the fact that um uh, telling a surveyor that you believe that interracial marriage should not be permitted is a norm that has shifted in the us and it's simply largely socially unacceptable to give that answer to a surveyor however that norm is so far from shifting in india that people 
still that a majority of people find it okay to tell a surveyor that not just them or their own children, but nobody should have an intercaste marriage. In other surveys, large numbers of people have said that intercaste marriage should be banned, that laws should be brought in to, to ban intercaste marriage. So the, so the norm is really that far uh, from shifting. Um, and I think some, some people, when they see this point argued, uh, ask me if maybe this, uh, maybe what this says is that people uh, are less likely to lie in Indian surveys while they're more likely to lie. In, is that the only difference? But I don't think it's purely a question of lying. It's a question, you know, social acceptability bias also tells you something about what is socially acceptable. And the fact that it is socially acceptable in India to say that nobody should have an intercaste with interreligious marriage is, is a key point. So I think India needs to have a reckoning with with these numbers and with uh, what's coming out with these surveys to, uh, you know, and I want to talk about interreligious views in particular, because I do think that the sort of epidemic of Islamophobia that is, uh, and, you know, phobia is a, a mild term for the sort of violent um, uh, violence that's going on across the country. Um, I think it's important to make that point that um, we are so far from uh, large parts of the country are so far from even recognizing Muslims as equal citizens that then talking about the norms that need to change around uh, interreligious marriage, for example, are uh, are very far from where from where current reality is. So uh, this is this is a reckoning around numbers that come out from survey after survey that really needs to happen now. Thank you, uh, Rukmi. Before we go to the audience, um, I want to just hand it over to Diego for one final intervention. Diego? Yes, thank you. Um, well, um, I should really be asking about the chapter on elections uh, because I am the political scientist here, but I, I'm not going to do it because I think uh, um, th there is one chapter, chapter one, uh, which really is, uh, again, mind blowing. Uh, and this also gives an idea to the audience of the kind of work that Rukmini has done. And um, this is about data on um, uh, sexual assaults and rapes uh, in Delhi in the year 2013, uh, which is the year after the horrific um, uh, 2012 uh, gang rape and murder, uh, which um, made India the uh, rape capital of the world uh, uh, in, in, in many journalistic accounts uh, in India and abroad. Uh, so what Rukmini did was going through all of the 600 judgments passed by in cases involving rape in Delhi in the year 2013, and she discovered a quite different picture from what had been reported uh, by Indian and international media. Can you tell us what you discovered by going through uh, all those 600 uh, judgments? Thank you for asking me this because it really is something um, very close to my heart. Uh, I lived in Delhi at the time and um, I went to the, the protest after uh, the, you know, the day after the young woman uh, had died in a Singapore hospital. And, uh, the, you know, that feeling of pent up rage in Indian women was really palpable at the time. It was a conversation that had to, that was long overdue, but I do fear that it went in, um, problematic and counterproductive uh, directions. So as you point out, I had to look, I ended up looking at all 600 cases heard by Delhi's seven district courts in one calendar year. And the reason I did this is because from my years of reporting um, in police stations um, across the country, I had a good sense of just how problematic first information reports, which is the initial police report um, in, in Indian police stations are. Um, I knew that um, that these sort of FIRs, as they're called, are uh, are the result of a complex interplay of social factors, uh, which include, you know, um, power, politics, uh, shame, stigma. All of these are sort of forces that come into play then, and uh, the knowledge that these FIRs were the building blocks for. Uh, India's police statistics, and as a result, were forming the basis of all of our understanding around safety, um, women's rights in India, was, was a worrying concept to me. You know, when you know how, how bad the building blocks are, when you know how bad the bricks are, then you really worry about uh, the building that you're constructing from it. So I thought that taking it one step further would be better, which is to see 
how these police reports progress in court. And it would also give me much more additional information because there would be, uh, you know, uh, reams of documents around each case rather than just that, uh, that uh, pure number that was coming out from each uh, FIR. What I ended up finding was that uh, 460 of these cases were fully argued before courts because uh, in many of them, um, the complainant turned hostile. And again, complainants turning hostile in, 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 in the Indian popular media is uh, equated with women being silenced. And while that might certainly happen, what also was happening was that uh, some of these were cases that uh, had been filed under duress and the woman complainant did not want to progress with it and in court was able to tell the judge that. So what I found is that the largest category of these 460 cases dealt with um, consenting uh, couples in which the uh, uh, father or the uncle of the woman had filed a case of uh, sexual assault and often kidnapping against the male partner. These were often interreligious and intercaste couples and the sort of tight control over uh, women's sexual agency um, th that most families are able to exhibit. This was their way of pushing back against uh, any demonstration of sexual independence or independence in choosing their partners uh, that, that women were demonstrating. And, um, you know, these were shocking cases in which uh, the, the further documents would show that the, that the couple had been pursued across the country often by the family, separated, the, you know, the woman put in a shelter home, the man often thrown into jail. There was a lot of violence inflicted on, uh, often on both the man and the women, on the woman. And so essentially what these were, were not sexual assault cases of the sort that are in the popular imagination, but were parental criminalization of consenting relationships. This was the largest share of uh, sexual assault cases. Uh, in addition, there was also um, uh, cases of what is called breach of promise to marry, which is a, a sort of um, uh, Victorian era, uh, uh, you know, a, a sort of hangover of uh, the British uh, police code that exists in India, which allows uh, a woman who has um, not been married by a man who sort of you know, breach of promise to, to file this case. Again, this was a sort of manifestation of the uh, pressures on women's um, uh, sexual autonomy to the point that a woman pursuing a relationship that doesn't uh, end in marriage can often face such enormous pressure and stigma from society that they are often forced to file uh, cases of these sort to, to, to ensure that, that, that there is a marriage. So what I ended up finding is that um, uh, what is called stranger rape, which is um, essentially what the Delhi case that galvanized the world was, was, a, was an absolutely uh, tiny minority uh, of the cases. In fact, the Delhi case, which was one of the cases that came out in the data set I looked at, stood out in terms of just how unusual it was. Um, I think, you know, sometimes what can happen is when I present these numbers, um, people then ask me, so is there no sexual violence in India? Is this, uh, was the conversation after 2012 uh, wrong? Was it, is it just that uh, people are going after consenting couples? So I, I do want to say that first we need to talk about the fact that people are going out to, after consenting couples. And I feel, think, again, the interreligious and intercaste couples um, are a particular source of worry here because of the weaponization against um, uh, interreligious and intercaste couples that's been happening in the last couple of years, aided and abetted by laws in some states as well. Uh, so this is only going to get worse. Um, and I do want to, you know, emphasize that there is a crime going on here, just not necessarily the one that the uh, police statistics were capturing. Um, I think there is a fair, the, you know, there is a lot of sexual violence that goes on in India as well. But again, one of the num one of the points that comes out extremely clearly in statistics, but again doesn't permeate through to sort of popular imagination, is that because marriage is so universal in India it, uh, and happens so early, the vast majority of sexual violence that women experience in India is within the marriage. And we know this again from statistics because this comes out in answers given in the demographic uh, and health surveys uh, to the point that over 90% of the sexual violence that women said that they experienced was at the hands of their husbands. Now, the sort of um, grim corollary to this is that marital rape is not recognized as a crime in India. There is a marital rape exception in Indian uh, statistics. Um, and this is a case that is currently being argued before the Delhi High Court. So all of these numbers together add up to the point that 
um, there is sexual violence going on in India, but um, the, the sort of narrative around it, as well as the advocacy focus around it is truly misdirected. Um, and as laws get tighter, as they did in the aftermath of the 2012 attack, uh, they often end up making these sort of um, independent decisions, especially by interreligious couples, all the more difficult. Um, what's also ended up happening is that a lot of underage or teenage uh, relationships are um, uh, being criminalized again because of a change in the laws that happened after 2012. So um, I unfortunately feel that when we're going to look at the sort of history of feminist jurisprudence um, of the last few decades, we are going to see 2012 as a turning point in a frightening direction uh, in that it actually ended up um, you know, narrowing the scope of autonomy for women. Great, thank you so much, uh, Diego and Sneha, and thank you, Rukmi. So let's now move to uh, the audience Q&A. We have two questions um, so far. Um, so the first one is from Mr. Girija Pandey, who wants to know uh, if you could discuss conclusions you have drawn from various data sets. Maybe I will kind of ask a ask something on top of that. So just to make sense of certain conclusions, which I found was really surprising. So th there, there are two conclusions in the chapters on spending and jobs, which, which was really astounding to me. Uh, on the chapter on spending, uh, you, you argue that uh, Indians on spend little under 2,500 rupees a month with the average Indian spending around nearly 4,000 rupees a month. Um, and there are alarming gaps between the spending habits of the affluent with that of other income segments. Why do we know so little about the rich in India and how they spend mo their money? So that's the first question. The second data point, again, tied to uh, the economy uh, and the chapter on jobs, which I found really staggering, was around unemployment. Um, officially, as you write in the book, the unemployment rate is around 5%. But within certain groups, it's much, much higher. And, and one group um, is uh, highly qualified Indian women. So Indian women with a secondary education, uh, the unemployment rate is 18%, which is astounding. Almost nearly one in five uh, women in India who have a secondary education are unemployed. So uh, can you sh shed some light on these two data points and conclusions? What's going on here? Thank you so much for this. Uh, something that um, uh, you know, Dalit activists in India sometimes point out as well is that we know, uh, you know, so much of um, uh, Indian statistical enterprise is directed at the lives of uh, Dalits and people from backward caste, for example, and so little is directed at the lives and practices and spending uh, habits of its richest, of its upper caste. You know, th this is a point that's often made that the that um, you know the gaze is very unidirectional in India. So um, I do think that part of the reason that we know so little about how the rich in India spend their money is because the information that we do have about how the rich spend their money is then um, believed to be data about how Indians spend money. Uh, you know, when, when there's information around say uh, sales of cars and two wheelers, this is often uh, used to argue that the country is doing well as a, uh, on a whole, uh, on the whole. Well, I think uh, what it says is how well a, a very small segment of the country is doing and, um, you know, what is being bought and sold within that category. So I think there's sort of two uh, levels of failure here. One is a, a failure of, uh, uh, you know, direction and the other is a, a sort of extrapolation failure. Um, I think one of the ways this is also sort of very... Um, uh, literally manifested is that sometimes in uh, in distributions where you're looking at either income or consumption distributions for the for the you know narrowest that top one percent the upper bound is not shown because the assumption is that we just don't know how much the richest Indians uh, earn or spend so you can say something about the lower bound of the top one percent but you can't say anything about the upper bound of it the very fact that there are sort of ellipses at the end tell us how little we know about the rich um, one thing that's happened in the last couple of years is 
a certain pushback against household surveys because um, uh, because of some of these issues, which is that household surveys seem to paint a picture of a country that is uh, struggling much more than what perhaps some in uh, politics and some in the media would like to portray. And the sort of counter argument there is then to focus more on what is called administrative data. So you see this quite strikingly, uh, both for consumption and for employment information. You know, when, um, when the 2017-18 numbers on household consumption expenditure came out and pointed out this, these extremely low, num low numbers, the fact that uh, the average Indian spends under 2,500 every month, for example, the the count, the you know, the reasons given for suppressing this information uh, included that this could certainly not be true because look, for example, at the sales of cars. Um, so you know that sort of information, more administrative data, is um, is information is data that is being pointed to increasingly. This similarly happens in the case of employment. In 2019, we similarly had um, uh, shockingly high um, unemployment numbers. As, I'll, as you pointed out, and as I'll come to in a minute, these still are very low, but for India, they were high. They were a 45-year high. And again, the data that was pointed to as an alternative was payroll data, which is, um, you know, uh, sort of no, no serious economist anywhere in the world would look at payroll as a source of uh, understanding unemployment. However, this is sort of the direction that um, many who are pushing back against household data are pointing at, for example. Um, so yes, perhaps what we need is a, a, a survey focused on India's uh, upper caste and on its rich. We need to understand better the spending practices of the rich and we, you know, this would um, uh, uh, correlate quite significantly with being among the uh, upper caste of this country and as we know from other information the practice of untouchability for example is most is highest among India's upper caste so perhaps um, uh, you know the practice of caste for example needs to be studied uh, far better among India's upper caste. Um, to get to the point about um, unemployment, as you po pointed out, there are some segments, including the young uh, and women, among whom unemployment rates are very high. And for women, part of the reason this is particularly worrying is because the labor force participation rates of Indian women are so low that from that small pool, if there is still a high unemployment rate, that's a particularly damning indicator. Such few Indian women are making it to the workforce at all. Then if they're further not finding jobs, then that is a sort of double whammy. Um, there are a lot of, uh, you know, there's a sort of rich debate in India and across the world about why India's labor force participation rates for women are so low. And the answer is probably lies somewhere at the intersection of sociology and of economics, which is that there certainly seem to be social norms uh, that dictate against women being in the paid workforce, against women leaving the house, um, uh, against women moving away from uh, childcare and domestic responsibilities, which are almost entirely uh, shouldered by Indian women alone, um, and you know, moving towards uh, paid work. Um, as I point out in the book, the, the vast share of uh, Indian uh, men men's working hours uh, go on paid work, while the vast share of Indian women's working hours go on entirely unpaid work. And again, a, a minor data point, but that I'll never forget, which is that um, uh, the an unemployed Indian man still spends less uh, minutes every day on a household than an employed uh, Indian woman. So that, that really, you know, it's a striking number to me. It really points out just how strong this imbalance is. Um, some feminist economists in the last few years, including the economist uh, Ashwini Deshpande, the feminist labor economist Ashwini Deshpande, have been also talking about the nature of jobs that are available for women. Because given the considerable quote unquote sacrifices that are required of an Indian woman to be able to make it to the paid workforce, are the jobs that are uh, available for women um, adequate? Are they well paying enough? Uh, do they pr provide enough security, both physical and sort of financial, to make this leap into the workforce feasible for women? So I think we're probably going to find um, the answers to this at the intersection of multiple forces. And unlike for men, this is probably not a purely economic issue uh, in the case of Indian women. Thank you. Um, next question is from Gideon. 
Um, I guess he asks, what's the future here in terms of uh, data and how do we like remove it from the bias that does exist? Uh, is that possible? Um, and or are there different futures in, in terms of uh, collecting and using and analyzing data? Uh, is it more privatization? Uh, you mentioned a CMIE whose own uh, data is becoming more popular, even though it's uh, it's exclusive. Um, is it more digitization? And you see that happening rapidly. Uh, you do cover in the book the um, the NSO, which is now a part of another um, ministry. Which so it's it's I guess it's 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 felt it's fallen under more political control now. So it's some of the reforms. Um, so what's your sense on where we go from here? So I do want to say that I feel that the uh, that entrenched biases, for example, have not played as an important a role in the collection of data than is uh, popularly imagined. I think the uh, quality of Indian data has remained largely, um, you know, beyond reproach uh, for decades, and the and the you know instances in which there have been malpractices have been so scandalous as to. Uh, you know, lead to public a public uproar. The reason that they stand out in this conversation is because they are rare and because they are, continue to be seen as scandalous. It isn't we aren't yet in a stage where uh, you know uh, an important government report can be suppressed or uh, GDP numbers that look a bit questionable can come out and that there should that there's no debate or discussion around it. That's that's not the the situation or that it's so routine that. Uh, you know that you assume that these are bad numbers and don't bother with them. That's that's not where uh, we stand. But yes, in the narrative building around it, um, uh, entrenched biases have become uh, you know biases have become entrenched. Um, of course, I would start by saying that trying to look at the numbers afresh would be an important way to go about it. Just just one example. Um, you know, because we typically assume that this sort of pushback comes uh, only from the right. Um, one sort of argument I have been having, for uh, instance, with some on the left is around the question of um, uh, providing eggs in India's noon school, which, uh, you know, um, it, it's, a, it's complicated to explain why it's such a political issue. But uh, as you know, you know, um, with notions of purity taking on greater importance under uh, uh, when there is more sort of uh, right wing uh, influence, uh, there is again a pushback against the eating of meat, which can include eggs, which has in some cases led to a push against having eggs provided in the um, school meal provided in government schools. But I think, you know, so this has become a contentious issue, but uh, a data point that I think that gets missed in this is that um, the vast majority of the population, a majority of the population in many of these states in which this has become such a battleground uh, are not meat eaters. So I do, I have in the book made the argument that the median Indian very much is uh, a meat eater. And you know, this these notions of India as a vegetarian country are not based in fact, but um, uh, there are entrenched biases on the left as well, which sometimes uh, uh, come in the way of uh, of truly fair debate. Um, I, I just want to you know make the point that there are entrenched biases on occasion from the left as well. Um, towards what would you know? So I do feel that the problem doesn't lie yet in the collection of data. But yes, we are having a big problem in data transparency in the last couple of years, and not just that. We we are facing um, a lot of sort of uh, hostility against uh, when there is critical reporting using this information. And these sort of forces sometimes combine. So for example, a data source that I used a couple of times in the last couple of, in the last eight months or so while reporting on the pandemic was India's national health missions administrative data. And I this is information that's been online since 2008 or so and is available, has been uploaded every month for over 10 years now. But when I use this information to uh, uh, say things that were not flattering about what had happened during the pandemic, uh, the data was pulled off. Uh, it would be put back online and pulled off again. And now we've not had this information online since May 2021. So uh, 
there is something, there is a failure going on here. If we've not been able to create enough democratic pressure for data to simply be made consistently available and then criticism to be sort of taken on the chin. If we've reached a point where democratic pressure, either from the media or from uh, politicians, has not uh, built up to the point that data is seen as something that is uh, a right of Indian citizens and cannot be taken off at will from government websites, then, then there's a failure in the democratic project. There's some, there's not enough, you know, work going on over here. I, I don't usually put the, uh, I wouldn't immediately lay the blame at the government's doorstep. What, what are the processes of holding government accountable that are failing here that have allowed this, uh, this, us to reach this juncture? So yeah, I think I've asked more questions than I've answered. <laughs> Uh, so we have about five minutes left, and maybe we can end with two questions. Uh, so the first one uh, there is from Ramita, and she wants she asks, "What surprised you most regarding voting patterns uh, in India?" Uh, and the last one, maybe uh, the one question which I had, uh, is that the book does cover a lot of issues. Um, are there any issues or areas that you wish you could have covered in this book? Thank you. Um, yes, on voting patterns, I think one of the things that uh, that's come out in research from others, including uh, the political scientist Rahul Verma, that I have referred into the book, uh, referred to in the book, which surprised me, was we've known now for a while in India that uh, that there are enormous information asymmetries um, between politicians and voters in India. And what this often leads to is um, credit or blame being placed at the wrong doorstep. So typically, um, state governments who are closer in all ways, including physically to the voter than uh, national governments, tend to be given a lot more blame and credit for uh, government schemes, even if they are national schemes. It's that sort of tyranny of distance, if you will. Um, one of the things, one of the sort of essential trends that's happened in India in the last couple of years is the breakdown of this dynamic. The, the messaging of the current government has been so consistently on point that this lack of uh, uh, credit for schemes that the central government uh, typically does um, has, has stopped happening now. Voters are much more likely to lay credit or blame at the door of the central government. And you know, while this might seem like a technical sort of point, I think it points to uh, a very key shift in um, in the relationship between politicians and voters. It, it talks about, it sort of points to how you can shift a information asymmetries. And through that, perhaps, you know, the very sort of direction and even the uh, power and nature of, of the political process. So um, this is, I think, a vital trend uncovered by Rahul Varma and others, which, which surprised me. Um, on things that I hadn't uh, thought of, um, uh, that I haven't looked at in the book, something that actually um, quite a few people have brought up is that I didn't look at uh, data on education. And this is actually quite a, um, a rich source, a, a potential 11th or, or missing chapter, because um, India has struggled for some time with understanding how to measure education uh, outcomes. We've typically only measured inputs in education and um, outputs has been something that's that's left to um, uh, private agencies and something that the government has sort of pushed back against. There's also a lot of, um, you know, the, the, the entire sort of RCT world in a way has converged around Indian education. And while it's also a rich source of data, it also raises um, ethical um, and sort of complicated moral questions. So I think education would have been um, a good one to look at. Thank you so much, Rukmini. We're almost out of time. Uh, I, I want to end by thanking Rukmini for writing the book and being here with us to talk about it. Uh, we need more deeply grounded, engaging books like this to make sense of India. Uh, so please do go buy it and read it if you haven't. Uh, the link is here in the chat box. Um, I also want to thank Sneha and Diego for being here and discussing the book with me. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Yeah.
discussion. This brings the big discussion to an end. We thank you for your participation. Have a good evening.